Please join me now in welcoming our guest, Professor Noam Chomsky. Thanks. I think a uh, useful place to start might be with a recent academic study by an Oxford professor of traditions of war, which contrasts uh, two leading paradigms in the study of just war, what the author calls the uh, Grotian and Republican interpretations. First para paradigm traces back to Hugo Grotius, famed 17th century humanist, who founded the dominant framework of thinking on laws of war. Within this paradigm, a law of war is an act of states, and just war proposals are means to uh, humanize, to introduce humanity in warfare, one tradition. The contrasting uh, Republican paradigm traces back to Rousseau and the uh, uprising against monarchy and feudalism in the late 18th century, including the American Revolution. This paradigm blends war with justice, with liberty, uh, equality, uh, individual and community rights, whatever else may fall within our uh, concept of justice. Well, these positions are, of course, idealizations. The real world is more complex. The formal implementation of efforts to uh, introduce humanity into warfare do not simply disregard questions of justice, but they do, do put them to the margins. They're not central to the codification of the uh, principles of world order and practice, uh, with the single exception of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has a pretty tattered history. Well, despite real-world complexities, uh, the differences between these two approaches to just war, I think, deserve attention in uh, considering both the issues that are addressed and those that are ignored. We might ask whether that itself is just. There are at least uh, three major sources of insight into the concepts of just war. Now, the first is the scholarly literature. Now, the second is the underlying notions of uh, human nature that underlie our moral judgments. And the third is the uh, international codifications. So I'd like to say a few words about each of these topics. I think it may help to uh, indicate in advance where I'm heading. Uh, in brief, my own conclusions are that the literature merits careful attention, but is ultimately not very instructive about just war. Secondly, that the notions of human nature should be at the heart of the discussion, although serious inquiry into this is still in its early stages. And third, that the codifications are, seem to me sensible, uh, but actions in the real world all too often uh, reinforce a famous maxim of Tacitus that the strong do as they can, uh, while the weak do as they must. So let's uh, start with some uh, remarks on uh, some of the current literature on just war. Uh, one of the most recent studies is Michael Walter's book, Arguing About War, which merits particular attention, not only because of the high praise it's uh, received, but also because Walter is responsible for the recent revival of just war theory. The strengths, I, I think the book reveals both the strengths and the weaknesses of just war theory. The strengths are that many of the conclusions seem plausible enough, at least to me, but particularly those conclusions that pretty much reiterate standard codifications. The weakness is that despite the book's title, Arguing About War, it's very hard to find an argument. You might try that as an experiment. And more accurately, while arguments are sometimes detectable, they rely crucially on such premises as seems to me entirely justified, or I believe, or no doubt. Uh, and there's almost no effort to bring in relevant background information and evidence. Walter gives two paradigm examples, which in which case uh, he simply asserts that the wars are just, in fact so obviously just that argument is unnecessary. 
The two examples are Afghanistan and Kosovo. Uh, he describes the Af invasion of Afghanistan as a triumph of just war theory, which stands alongside the bombing of Serbia in 1999 as an uncontroversial case of just war. Uh, no argument is felt to be necessary, although in either case it doesn't take much effort to think of possible uh, evidence that might bear on the pronouncement that these are triumphs of just war theory. And these are considerations that would certainly be brought, by, brought up by just war theorists if the responsibility for the military action lay elsewhere. Well, for lack of time, I'll skip illustrations, but can come back to them if you'd like. To be clear, I'm not asking whether the bombings of Afghanistan and Serbia were right or wrong. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I'm asking a different question, namely, what does just war theory have to say about it? And I think if you look closely, you'll find the, that the answer is that it has nothing to say about it. We're left with assertions of the authors that state violence was justified, uh, uncontroversially so, and any consequences, whether anticipated or not, are un entirely, no doubt, the fault of the official enemy. Well, another recent and also highly regarded inquiry into just war theory is by a moral political philosopher, Jean Belka Elstein. Uh, the paradigm of just war, she writes, is the bombing of Afghanistan, and she adds that nearly everyone, with the exception of absolute pacifists and a few lunatics, agree that the bombing of Afghanistan was clearly a just war. Argument ended. In reality, nearly everyone excludes substantial categories of people. The majority of the world's population, for example, even in Europe, uh, far more so in Latin America, and also uh, leading Afghans who had been fighting the Taliban, and including U.S. favorites, uh, and uh, virtually all uh, aid agencies working there. Uh, but what's relevant is that this constitutes the sole argument to establish that the war was just, in fact, uncontroversially so. The facts are irrelevant, and no further argument is needed. Well, Elstein does provide criteria for just war. So we at least have the rudiments of a theory. Four criteria, I'll read them. First criterion, the war must be openly declared or otherwise, well, otherwise authorized by a legitimate authority. Uh, second, it must begin with the right intentions. Third, uh, force is justified if it protects the innocent from certain harm, as when a country has certain knowledge that genocide will commence on a certain date. Uh, fourth, it must be a last resort after other possibilities for the redress and defense of the values at stake have been explored. Well, the first two conditions are vacuous. Declaration of war by an aggressor confers no support whatsoever for a claim of just war. And even the worst criminals claim right intentions. The third and fourth conditions sound reasonable, but they have no relevance at all, clearly, to the case of Afghanistan. So therefore, uh, Elstein's par paradigm example collapses uh, entirely under her own criteria. Let me add just one word on the classic modern work, uh, Michael Walzer's uh, Just and Unjust Wars, which I believe you've been reading. My personal judgment is that his conclusions are generally very reasonable, also pretty much in accord with the conventional reading of the United Nations Charter. But what's relevant here is that the con conclusions just about invariably uh, rely crucially on the ubiquitous phrase, uh, it seems to me, and so on, and you might test. So just as an illustration, take what he uh, regards as the hardest question, in his words. That is, the British bombing of uh, urban centers in Germany up to the end of the war. Walzer concludes that such bombing, quoting him, after the immediate threat posed by Hitler's early victories had passed, was entirely indefensible. Maybe so, but uh, if you check, you'll find there's no argument, apart from the statement that the policy seems cruel. Well, I think it does. It seems cruel to me, at least. But what does just war theory have to say? Where does it enter into the argument? 
And why are relevant facts disregarded? There are, after all, relevant facts. Well, the character, the theory, is revealed further when we look at the examples that Walter gives, just about a half a dozen examples, which are just listed, no argument or discussion, to show, uh, the, uh, to show that just war theory applies, leaving, in his words, no doubt. The examples are mostly uncontentious, although one might well ask why some of these examples are chosen but not others. Now, for example, the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia is given as a case where there is no doubt, but not given is uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which I suppose had about a hundred times as many casualties and many more during the 22 years of occupation of, Le of southern Lebanon in defiance of Security Council orders. So maybe there's a reason, maybe there isn't, but whatever it is, it's not given. That's all examples except one. Now, the last example of uh, a case where just war theory applies, leaving no doubt, is the Egyptian challenge to Israel in 1967. Now, that's the sole example in the long period covered where just war theory allegedly demonstrates that a preemptive strike was just beyond all doubt. Well, maybe the selection of cases and the conclusions are correct, and maybe they're not, but what's relevant here is that just war theory plays little, if any, role in the argument, which reduces uh, uh, pretty much to declarations of personal preference. Well, I won't go on, but these are, to my knowledge, fairly representative selections from the most highly regarded literature, and I think it's fair to conclude more generally that we learn very little about just war from just war theory, although we do learn something about the uh, prevailing intellectual uh, moral climate in which the theory is presented and honored. Well, let's turn to the second source of potential insight. Second source of potential insight into just war theory, that is our intuitive moral judgments. Well, here we are turning to what was traditionally called moral philosophy. I think it's more aptly described as moral psychology in modern terms. It's after the divorce of science and philosophy in the mid-19th century. A century before that, David Hume had done his classic work on what he called the springs and origins of human nature. Uh, Hume recognized that uh, knowledge and belief are grounded in what he called a species of natural instincts, part of our inherent mental nature. He recognized also that something similar uh, must be true in the domain of moral judgment. His reason was that our moral judgments are unbounded in scope. We are constantly applying them in systematic ways to new circumstances in a manner that's intelligible to others. Hence, they too must be founded on general principles that are part of our nature, although beyond what he called our original instincts, meaning the narrower instincts uh, that we share with animals. Well, that insight, which I think is accurate, should lead uh, directly to uh, efforts to develop something like a grammar of moral judgment. It's an enterprise very much like the inquiry into the principles that are encoded somehow in our brains that permit us to do what uh, you, and, you and I are now doing, and uh, more broadly to produce and understand uh, linguistic expressions over an unbounded range and use them in a way which is appropriate to circumstances and intelligible to others, uh, even though they may be quite new uh, in our own history, our own experience, in fact, all of history. Well, as was recognized a century before Hume, uh, these principles must be universal, hence grounded in our nature and the basis for acquisition of any particular language. Uh, today, we would say that the principles of language and moral judgment uh, are part of our genetic endowment, part of human biology. In both cases, they're culturally specific and universal aspects. In both 
the case of internal faculties of language and moral judgment. These things can be studied. They're part of science, and in fact, studied in rather similar ways. Inquiry into the moral faculty in these terms was undertaken by the leading American moral and political philosopher of the late 20th century, John Rawls, who relied explicitly on the analogy of uh, two linguistic theories that were being developed in the 1960s at the time that uh, he was writing his classic work, Theory of Justice. Rawls, in fact, put this aspect of his work aside under severe criticism by moral philosophers, turned to core issues for him. Now, the criticisms were re-examined and I think adequately refuted in a doctoral dissertation a few years ago by John Mikhail, who is now a law professor at Georgetown, a forthcoming book of his, based on the dissertation, develops this and also presents uh, empirical investigation of moral judgments in puzzling thought experiments that have been designed by moral philosophers. Uh, this experimental work reveals that uh, intuitions in these quite puzzling cases are typically instantaneous and reflexive uh, in adults and children uh, with systematic changes through early childhood development, much as in other aspects of development. He then goes on to develop a theoretical explanation in terms of uh, fixed principles that can be regarded as a development of Rawls' theory of justice and the much earlier work of Hume and other uh, classical writers on our natural instincts. Now, there's another book soon to come out by Harvard primatologist and cognitive scientist Mark Hauser, uh, carrying such inquiries further, it includes comparative studies and more general ideas about what he calls the moral organ, analogous to the language organ, uh, other subcomponents of the cognitive systems that are a core part of our biological nature. Well, in recent years, these topics have become a lively field of theoretical and empirical inquiry the, uh, from many points of view, incidentally. It's, it's a study of principles that underlie intuitive conceptions of justice and rights and their cultural variety, their limited cultural variety, and their universal properties. That could someday provide uh, foundations for a more substantive theory of just war, uh, but it remains largely a task for the future, though it's underway in interesting, in interesting ways. Well, finally, a couple of words on the codification of these intuitive judgments in the past century. I'll keep to the period after World War II, although the earlier conventions have very clear and significant contemporary relevance. Hague Conventions of 1907, for example, we can come back to that if you like. The post-Second World War codification of the laws of war it consists primarily of the uh, UN Charter, the Geneva Conventions, and the Nuremberg Principles, uh, later adopted by the General Assembly. Well, as you know, I'm sure, the Charter bars the threat or use of force, uh, except in two instances, if uh, authorized by the Security Council of the United Nations, or under Article 51 of the Charter, in self-defense against armed attack, until the Security Council acts. The phrase armed attack is conventionally interpreted in terms of Daniel Webster's principle, which extends armed attack to uh, cases where, in his words, the necessity for action is urgent, is instant, overwhelming, and leaving no choice of means and no moment of deliberation. Uh, any other resort to force is a war crime, uh, in fact, the supreme international crime encompassing all the evil that follows, in the words of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Now, there was a high-level UN panel meeting and issued its report in December 2004, included, among others, former National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft. It concluded that Article 51 needs neither extension nor restriction 
of its long understood scope. It should be neither rewritten nor reinterpreted. Last September, uh, the UN World Summit uh, reaffirmed, quoting, that the relevant prov provisions of the Charter are sufficient to address the full range of threats to international peace and security. The summit further endorsed the responsibility to commit ourselves to helping states build capacity to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity, and to assisting those which are under stress before crises and conflicts break out. The summit granted no new right of intervention to individual states or regional alliances, whether under humanitarian or other professed grounds, and it established no responsibility to protect, contrary to what was widely alleged in news reports and commentary. The uh, high-level panel of December 2004 had reached the same conclusion in words that were specifically directed at international, at intellectual opinion and state practice in the West in recent years. Its words were these, for those impatient with declaring Article 51 to be appropriate as formulated, the answer must be that in a world full of perceived potential threats, the risk to the global order uh, and the norm of non-intervention on which it continues to be based is simply too great for the legality of unilateral preventive action as distinct from collectively endorsed action to be accepted. Allowing one to so act is to allow all. Allowing one to so act is to allow all. Now here the panel is presupposing the principle of universality, namely that we apply to ourselves the same standards we do to others, if not more stringent ones. Now that's perhaps the most elementary of moral truisms, and it's the foundation of just war theory, if that theory is to be taken at all seriously. The principle, however, is flatly rejected in the elite intellectual, moral, and political culture of the most powerful states, and it's explicitly rejected by official doctrine. Now that includes the expositors and advocates of just war theory, also includes a substantial legal literature. Pretty easy to uh, illustrate. There's plenty of material on print about it. Well, in this, and we can draw some conclusions from that. In this connection, and by saying that it's worth remembering some uh, eloquent words on the principle of universality, foundation of just war theory and any serious moral uh, theory. The, uh, comment by uh, Justice Robert Jackson, he was the chief of counsel for the prosecution at Nuremberg. He informed the tribunal that if certain acts of violation of treaties are crimes, they are crimes whether the United States does them or whether Germany does them. And we are not prepared to lay down a rule of criminal conduct, conduct against others, which we would not be willing to have invoked against us. We must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow. To pass these defendants a poison chalice is to put it to our own lips as well. The supreme international crime for which the defendants were hanged at Nuremberg it was defined clearly enough by Justice Jackson uh, at Nuremberg. He proposed to the tribunal that an aggressor is a state that is the first to carry out invasion of its armed forces with or without a declaration of war of the territory of another state. Illustrations of that, too, are easy enough to find, and others are on the horizon. It's again noteworthy that these considerations are virtually excluded from the dominant intellectual and moral culture in the West rather generally, although we have no difficulty at all in applying them to official enemies. Well, once again, there's nothing special about our own country in this respect, except that it's more powerful than others. Such evasions 
with regard to the acts of one's own state are close to universal. They disfigure intellectual history as far back as you go. To the maxim of Tacitus that I quoted, uh, we may add an observation by President John Adams. Power always thinks it has a great soul and vast views beyond the comprehension of the weak. I think that's another near universal, again, all too easy to illustrate from the traditional practice of governments and the educated classes within them. Well, to return to the beginning, uh, what can one learn from just war theory? My feeling is that from the literature on just war, we learn mostly about the prevailing moral and intellectual climate in which we live. Scientific inquiry into moral psychology and its roots in our nature may someday provide important insights, but practice cannot wait for that day any more than engineering has waited for physics or medicine for biology for centuries in these cases, which are much simpler ones and much more accessible to inquiry than human nature. Thirdly, the codification of laws of war has over time had a notable civilizing effect, but the gap between professed ideals and actual practice is much too large to be tolerated, in my opinion. Thanks. Do I think that there's a responsibility to intervene in cases where just war theory concludes that it is correct to intervene? Is that the question? Personally, I agree with the uh, UN Charter, the uh, high-level UN panel of December 2004 and the UN World Summit, which I quoted. But I can't really answer the question because as far as I can determine, you can tell me if I'm wrong, a just war theory never tells you anything. It doesn't tell you when it's proper to intervene. What it tells you is, I think it's proper to intervene. Well, you know, I, I may also think so, but there's a big gap between assertion and argument, and between surmise and evidence. Uh, so if you can tell me where just war theory uh, entails that we ought to intervene, we can consider the question. But until that's done, done, we can't really consider the question. I was wondering, do you believe that it would have been right to uh, reassess Article 51 of the UN Charter, and do you believe that by not reassessing it and not rewriting it, it loses relevancy? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. By, by can you say it again? By not reassessing it not and reassessing not rewriting it, it yeah. do you believe it loses its... Well, it, it has been reassessed repeatedly. For example, by the uh, high-level UN panel of December that issued its report on 2004 with many distinguished participants. I mentioned Brent Scowcroft, but there are others. Yes, that's exactly what they did. They reassessed the UN Charter, and their conclusion is what I read. Uh, the UN World Summit um, last September again reassessed the UN Charter, and that's what it concluded. Maybe there should be a further reassessment. And fine, then let's undertake it, and let's consider their arguments or other arguments. But we can't say that it hasn't been reassessed. I mean, we can say that we haven't paid any attention to it. Well, that's possible, in fact, true. Uh, but it certainly has been reassessed by uh, very respectable and leading figures. And their conclusions, in my opinion at least, are pretty justified. However, I, to get back to the main topic, I don't think just war tells, theory tells us anything about that. When we judge these things, we're judging them on another basis on the basis of actual evidence about what happens in particular cases, in terms of our fundamental moral principles, which we should try to explicate and apply, like the principle of universality. Now, that's the way we should uh, reassess it. Also, we should, I think, think seriously about the statement that I quoted of the December 2004 panel that was directed to people like us it was directed to intellectual opinion in the West. And you uh, can read it again, but what they said is the uh, foundations of world order based on the principle of 
non-intervention in the affairs of others, not forceful intervention, is too important and too fragile to be destroyed, or the consequences will be terrible. Because for one to act is to grant the authority to all, at least if we believe in elementary moral principles. That's a heavy burden to bear. Maybe we could come up with a different conclusion in some cases. Actually, personally, I think we can, but it has to be argued. You said uh, that it's possible that Article 51 needs to be reassessed, but you mentioned earlier when you were referencing Walter's book that he said that the Israeli preemptive strike was just, or that he said that the Israeli preemptive strike was justified. You also stated that his arguments did not really have justification by his theory. However, in the case of the preemptive strike, he does say that there are several criterion that are necessary for the Israeli attack to be justified, specifically the fact that the Egyptian army was standing at a state of readiness that the Israeli army was incapable of holding. So under Article 51, even though Egypt had not yet invaded Israel, that they, they were not at war. However, what Egypt was doing tactically put Israel at a severe disadvantage. So under our modern definition of war, it seems to me that that ought to be, it, it seems to me, <laughs> it seems logical that it ought to be called an act of war, what Egypt was doing, putting Israel at such a disadvantage. So doesn't Article 51 definitely need some reason? Well, Article 51 clearly does not apply. Uh, I read Article, I, I mean, we can, argue that, we can argue that it was justified, but we can't say that Article 51 justifies it not under Daniel Webster's characterization or any other one that's accepted by the international community. We might argue, and here's where I think you could make an argument, that if you consider the range of uh, issues that arose at the time, the preemptive strike was justified. Maybe one can give such an argument. But the point is that no argument is given to that effect. None of the relevant facts are considered. And this is regarded as one of the half dozen cases where a just war theory entails that uh, the use of military force was legitimate. Uh, just war theory doesn't entail that. It doesn't entail anything. Uh, it, what it tells you is, well, I, Michael Waltz, Walter, believe this was justified, but without giving any reasons and without looking into the background. Uh, if you look into the background, it's a lot more complex than that. It's a lot of literature and scholarship on it. The U.S. didn't have to agree. Uh, there were all sorts of possibilities. You could have taken, I mean, I, I don't want to, if you want, I'll run through the background, but it's quite intricate and complex, uh, going back to the question of uh, free passage through the Straits of Tehran and whether that should be brought to the world court, which the U.S. and Israel refused to do, and Egypt insisted on, uh, re involves uh, Israeli strikes against Syrian targets, uh, all sorts of things. So yes, there's a complicated background. You could look at them. You could decide maybe that in the light of these complex, these complex circumstances, perhaps Israel was entitled to make a preemptive strike. But that's not what's claimed. What's claimed is that without looking at any evidence, just war theory, whatever it is, it's not easy to determine, uh, just war theory entails that this is one of the half dozen cases in the last century in which the use of force was no doubt legitimate and the only case in which a preemptive strike was legitimate. But we can also raise the question of universality. I mean, I don't believe, and I'm sure you don't believe, that Iran has a right to, uh, say, carry out terrorist acts in the United States right now. But undoubtedly, it's under serious threat. And undoubtedly, the threat is simply overwhelming as compared with Iran's capacities. But it would be outrageous to suggest that, of course. Uh, and if it's outrageous to suggest that, why is it legitimate in this case? I mean, for one to act is to give the right to all. And we can give a whole lot of other examples. I mean, let me give an even more outrageous one, okay? Not because not I accept it, of course, but just as an example. Uh, nobody I know of who's semi-sane it goes out every December 7th and celebrates Pearl Harbor Day. However, if we use these arguments, you can do it. Uh, uh, Japan on December 7th attacked U.S. military bases in 
who are in two, effectively, two U.S. colonies, territories claimed by the U.S., uh, Hawaii and the Philippines, tack military bases. Uh, the Japanese were perfectly capable of being, of reading what was being written in U.S. public journals. And in fact, U.S. intelligence, which had cracked the Japanese codes, know that they knew about it. And what was being written, going all the way up to the high military command, being reported by, you know, political commentators in the New York Times, was that the United States was, uh, that B-17s were running off the Boeing assembly line, uh, designed to be able to burn the, to the ground the, what they were called the ant heaps uh, in which the uh, Japanese lived. These wooden cities would burn them to the ground with their B-17 attacks. Uh, furthermore, B-17s were being shipped from the Atlantic, where they were needed, to Pacific bases in preparation for such attacks. Well, you know, is that a threat? Yeah, it's a pretty serious threat. Does that justify Pearl Harbor? I mean, not in 10 million years. But if that doesn't, why, does, why is this justified? Do you think our operations in Iraq are preventive or preemptive? And um, do you think that our operations in Iraq are just or unjust? Well, uh, the, the, there was interesting terminology in that. The administration presented it, and in fact, the National Security Council described, they had that in mind, but more generally, as preemptive war. But it certainly isn't preemptive war by any stretch of the imagination. More accurately, you could call it preventive war. Okay, you could say we have to prevent a potential attack against us. Personally, I don't see much justification for that, even if you accept that they believed all the reports that Colin Bell was giving at the UN Security Council and so on. Even if we accept that all that was believed, it doesn't seem to me that a preventive war in such a case is legitimate. And as you know, the world didn't think so either. Uh, there were international polls taken on this and outside the United States and to a lim less to a more limited extent, England. You could barely find a country in the world where support for it was above 10 percent. In fact, the only two exceptions in the international polls that were taken were uh, India and Israel. But both of them had something different in mind. Now, what they had in mind was their own repression of occupied territories, Kashmir and the occupied territories. You know, they liked the idea of preventive war by the powerful, but they weren't talking about this. However, the rest of the world was almost non-existent, you know, 10 percent or less. Uh, was, is it, and again, we have the same question. If preventive war is legitimate under those circumstances, it's legitimate for everybody. Okay, that means it's legitimate for Iran today. I mean, to take another case, it is simply undeniable, I mean, read it right in U.S. official document, that the United States uh, has been carrying out a terrorist war against Cuba since 1960. I mean, at first it was with direct participation. In more recent years, it's just with tolerance. But uh, that it happened isn't even questionable. You know, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy assigned his brother, Robert Kennedy, the task of running the terrorist war. Uh, it was to be his highest priority. Uh, Robert Kennedy's official, you know, more or less official biographer, historian Arthur Schlesinger, who was a well-known historian, who was a Kennedy member of the Kennedy team, a Latin American advisor, he writes that uh, Robert Kennedy's task was to bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba. And if you look back at the record, it was no joke. And it continues. Now, still based on U.S. soil. And the U.S. harbors, uh, happily harbors, uh, terrorists who were involved in it. Does that give Cuba the right to carry out terrorist acts in the U.S. Uh, to prevent this? Did it ever give them the right? Well, I don't think so. I'm sure you don't think so. But if preventive war is legitimate, why not? And in fact, uh, you know, and there are many other cases where, or t take say Lebanon in 1982, when Israel was preparing the attack, and in fact trying desperately to conjure up an excuse for the attack. They were bombing Lebanon, hoping for some retaliation that could be used as a pretext. And that was a serious attack, killed probably 
maybe 20,000 people, you know, destroyed a large part of southern Lebanon, the city of Beirut, much of it. Did that give Lebanon, the, uh, or the Palestinians in Lebanon, the right to uh, carry out the terrorist acts in Israel prior to it, to prevent the war? Well, I certainly don't think so. I'm sure you don't. Uh, but if preventive war is uh, legitimate under such ambiguous cases as uh, Iraq, why isn't that legitimate? So no, I don't think it was just. I think it was aggression. Sir, Walzer's legalist paradigm, uh, when he describes it, he also describes three revisions, one of which being the uh, human rights revision, uh, saying that it is justified to uh, intervene if human rights are being violated. Um, would you give any credence to the argument that Saddam, Saddam Hussein was in fact a tyrant that did violate human rights? No, oh, he certainly even, did. Even though, even though there were other reasons given for war, such as WMD, yeah. and additionally, um, Aggressors, or Walzer also describes um, aggressors as also being just to go against the war, get, go to war against. And when, when, and did he ever lose his status as an aggressor from the first Gulf War? Thank you. He lost his status as an aggressor when he was driven out of Kuwait, just as uh, Israel lost its status as an aggressor when, after 22 years, it pulled out of Lebanon. But and I can give plenty of other examples close to home. But as for the human rights violations, they were horrendous. And here is one of the cases where it really is important to look at facts before you make decisions. And we know the facts. They're not secret. So yes, Saddam Hussein carried out horrendous human rights violations. In fact, he's on trial for them right now. But have a look at the trial. Saddam Hussein is on trial for crimes that he committed in 1982. Right? Killed, he's charged with killing, probably accurately killing about 150 or signing the death warrant for 150 or so uh, Shiites who were involved in an uprising. Yeah, that's a crime. Uh, 1982 happens to be an important year in U.S. Iraqi relations. This should be headlines in a free press, in my opinion. It was a very important year. 1982 was the year in which uh, Ronald Reagan dropped Iraq from the list of states supporting terrorism so that the U U.S. could start providing him with extensive aid, including military aid, including means to develop uh, biological and chemical weapons and missiles and weapons of and nuclear weapons. He was dropped from, uh, uh, and Donald Rumsfeld, the next, uh, shortly after, went to firm up the agreement. The next charge against Saddam Hussein, the one's going to come along, it's been announced is a much more serious crime, the atrocities against the Kurds in 19, uh, uh, 1987, uh, 1988, the Anfal massacres, Halabja. Yeah, they were terrible. I mean, probably killed 100,000 people. The U.S. didn't object. In fact, the Reagan administration uh, blocked efforts in Congress even to protest against it. Furthermore, the uh, support for uh, Saddam increased and continued. In fact, Saddam was given an extraordinary privilege. Remarkable. I mean, he was allowed, he got away with attacking a U.S. naval vessel and killing 37 soldiers. I've seen it in 1987. That's pretty astonishing. Nobody can get away with that. But we were supporting, the Reagan administration was so strongly in support of Saddam, right through the worst atrocities, they even let him get away with that. I mean, in uh, 1980, this continued after the end of the war with Iran, after the worst atrocities. In 1989, uh, Iraqi uh, nuclear engineers were invited to the United States to take part in a conference, it was in Portland, Oregon, uh, in which they were uh, trained in how to develop weapons of mass destruction. Well, that's 1989. Uh, furthermore, George Bush, number one, told us why it was being done. They said, we have to provide aid to Saddam because it's of our responsibility to help U.S. exporters and because he contributes to stability in the region. In fact, that continued. I mean, take the, after the invasion of Kuwait, after he was driven out of Kuwait, you know, Iraq was practically bombed into rubble, the U.S. had total control of the area. There was an uprising, April, March, April, 1991, Shiite uprising in the South probably would have overthrown it. There were rebelling Iraqi generals. Uh, good chance he would have been overthrown. Well, the Bush administration determined that they would essentially permit Saddam to crush it. 
They used military helicopters, other armed equipment. They didn't have to do that. That led to a huge massacre. Uh, and it was described. You know, you can go back and read the New York Times right after that. They said, well, you know, it's regrettable, but there's a consensus among the U.S. and its allies, meaning Saudi Arabia and Britain, there's a consensus that, I'm virtually quoting, that Saddam Hussein offers more hope for the stability of the region than those who are trying to overthrow him. That's 1991, you know. Yeah, the human rights violations were horrendous. Does that have anything to do with the invasion? No, nothing. Mm -hmm.